us. Celebrate. And in doing that, um, we look to focus our community's attention on the ways in which students, faculty, and staff contribute to making uh, our university more international. To that end, we have invited a series of faculty members who have great experience in the field of global education. I would like to introduce them all in one fell swoop now, and then uh, we'll start the conversation. Please join me in welcoming the following faculty members to our round table today. First, we have Therese scarpelli Corey. She works on medieval theories of mind, cognition, and personhood with special focus on the thought of Thomas Aquinas and his 13th century interlocutors. Themes that animate her research include the nature of consciousness, the history of self and person, and concepts of subjectivity. She also explores what it means exactly to be immaterial and how it applies to mind and problems connected with mental representation and intentionality. In approaching these themes, she's particularly interested in uncovering different ways of modeling the mind and its activities. She's particularly interested in medieval Christian Europe and getting into the mindset of medieval philosophers on my, uh, getting into the mindset, excuse me, of medieval philosophers she explores the shared philosophical tradition that connects Muslim, Jewish, and Christian thinkers in the Middle Ages and traces its patterns of development from late antiquity. She serves on the executive committee on the Aquinas and Arabs project, and she's also a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Next, we have Father Jim Lease, Congregation of Holy Cross. Reverend James Lee, CSC, is the Interim Senior Director for Academic Initiatives and Partnerships for the University of Notre Dame London Global Gateway, a position he began in July of 2020. Formerly the Director for Catholic Initiatives and Outreach for the Notre Dame London Global Gateway. In his new role, Father Jim provides academic leadership for the Gateway's research initiatives while strengthening academic partnerships for Notre Dame's faculty and students across the United Kingdom. A priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross, Father Jim provides local leadership to advance global scholarship in conjunction with campus and with Notre Dame's global network. Additionally, he collaborates with campus partners and university partners uh, with regard to research opportunities and oversight of our G.K. Chesterton collection, which was recently acquired from the Oxford Oratory. Father Jim earned his BA in quantitative methods from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, an MA in psychological counseling from the University of Notre Dame, and an MDiv from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, and a PhD in educational psychology and human development from the University of Minnesota. Next, I'd like to introduce Jason Ruiz. He's the Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Notre Dame, where he's affiliated faculty with the program in Gender Studies and the Institute for Latino Studies. Ruiz's research focuses on American perceptions of Latin America with emphasis on race, culture, and economic imperialism, tourism, gender, and sexuality. His first book, Americans in the Treasure House, traveled to Porfirian, Mexico, and the Cultural Politics of Empire was published by the University of Texas Press in 2014. Ruiz is also published in the Radical History Review, American Studies, Journal of Transitional American Study, Transnational American Studies, excuse me, the Oral History Review, Aslan, and elsewhere. He's also the co-editor of four special issues and two books. He's provided written commentary to the New York Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and other media outlets. He's also the principal investigator of Latinx murals of Pilsen, a digital research project devoted to public art in Chicago, supported by the Whiting Foundation. He's also the 2016 recipient of the Edmund P. Joyce Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching at Notre Dame. Two final participants on the panel. Clemens Sedmak is professor of social ethics in the Keough School of Global Affairs and holds a joint appointment with Notre Dame Center for Social Concerns. He is also a concurrent professor of theology in the Department of Theology. A native of Austria, Clemens holds doctoral degrees in theology from the Catholic University of Linz, philosophy and social theory from the University of Innsbruck. 
Before coming to Notre Dame, he was the F.D. Maurice Professor of Moral and Social Theology at King's College London. Sedmak has previously served as director for the Center for Ethics and Poverty Research and chair for Epistemology and Philosophy of Religion at the University of Salzburg, where he was also president of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Ethics. Sedmak has authored numerous publications in German and English, including The Capacity to be Displaced, Resilience, Mission, and Inner Strength. His research interests include social ethics, the Catholic social tradition, and issues of poverty and social justice. Finally, we're pleased to welcome Rachel Thomas Morgan. She is an assistant professor of the practice for international engagement at the Center for Social Concerns of the University of Notre Dame. Thomas Morgan designed, implemented, and directs the International Summer Service Learning Program, which she established for the center in 1998. As a concurrent faculty member in the Department of Theology, Thomas Morgan oversees the international engagement area of the center, which includes the ISSLP, works with other center colleagues on community-based learning abroad and international seminars, and works with faculty across the university interested in developing courses that include international experiential or community-based learning components. She also consults on international related initiatives across the university. She received her master's in the area of systematic theology from the University of Notre Dame and her BA in religious studies and psychology from St. Mary's College. I welcome all of you to today's uh, conversation. I said at the outset that we are celebrating International Education Week and we as a university have great uh, news to celebrate. We were just uh, acknowledged in the Institute of International Education's Open Doors Report as being one of the top producers again of students who study abroad. 75.1% of Notre Dame undergraduates study abroad. And uh, I am thrilled that we are recognized in this kind of national way. It's a testament to our students and their curiosity about the wider world. But they get that curiosity from our faculty members. And I thought a good place for us to start um, thinking about international education is to hear from you all about how the global has figured into your own work. When did you first know that you wanted a global dimension in your work? How has it enriched your scholarship and how has it enriched your time at Notre Dame? I'm going to pick randomly. Jason, I'm going to start with you. Tell us about how you first knew you were interested in global issues with regard to your work in American studies and how that's made, been made manifest in your work with students today. I wanna to start by thanking you, Michael, for convening this panel. And it's really inspiring to see us coming together to talk about this stuff. And it's an honor to be among these other panelists. I would say my short answer to your question is early in grad. I got my PhD in American studies and it might surprise some people to think of American studies as kind of a globally focused intellectual endeavor, but we really are. Um, my, as you mentioned, my, my first book, my dissertation became my first book and I was really interested in, in the sort of transnational cultural connections between the United States and Mexico very, very early on, even within the paradigm and the, the, the rubric of, of American studies as a field. So when I got here, I was confession time, really, really hoping that American studies at Notre Dame would be a place that would also consider the international. And now that I'm chair of the department and my job is to also like know everyone's work very well, did I freeze? Are you good? No, you're good. Sorry, did, I, 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 am I back? You're back. <laughs> you're back. <laughs> now that I'm the, the uh, department chair in American studies, you know, my work is to know, uh, my job is to know everyone's work very well. And I've really seen just how my colleagues and myself are really looking at America in relation to the wider world. Uh, that includes my colleague, Perrin Gorel, who works on US and Turkey. You know, my colleague, Kathy Cummings, who's also um, been to Rome many times for research. So many of us are looking at the US not at this kind of discrete political or cultural entity, but as a dynamic force in the world that has to, and, and, and producing scholarship that says we have to have a relationship 
with the bigger world and we have to transnationalize our research. This started really in American studies in the 90s because American studies was a, a little more parochial than that um, in, in, for the first few decades of its existence as an as a academic field. But since then, the transnational turn in American studies has really challenged, I think, our, our scholarship to, uh, to think bigger, to think globally, to think in my particular subfield hemispherically. So Notre Dame has been a really good place for me to do this. And as I'll probably talk about a little bit later, I've taken students and also my own research now kind of to other parts of the world, including Mexico and more recently, Colombia. Thanks for that, Jason. Clemens, I, I'm, I'm interested as you listen to Jason talk about um, American studies and the ways in which it, it branches out into other kinds of global fields. If you coming to us from Austria um, have that same sort of feeling in reverse and, and whether or not Notre Dame attracted you in part for the same reasons that, that Jason is mentioning about um, an international dimension being important to your work, especially as it re with is with regard to so Catholic social teaching. So coming from Austria makes it easy to be attracted by the global dimension because Austria is so small and so unimportant and so irrelevant. Uh, and, and you have a number of Austrians, you know, singing about the Austro-Hungarian empire back then, we lost it all in 1918. Um, and coming from a small country really uh, encouraged me to be open to wider horizons so I came to Notre Dame from King's College London. And then one reason why I, I moved from Austria to London was because of the, the global status of the city. I, I love London and there is a quite easy way as I experienced it to have different cultures and, and traditions uh, next to each other. And then coming to Notre Dame, um, I was so pleased to see that um, the international dimension is uh, part of the DNA. So as you, as you mentioned, I have a joint appointment with the Center for Social Concerns and the Q School, where I'm particularly based in, in the Nanovic Institute. And the Center for Social Concerns, Rachel will speak to that, has this international um, dimension uh, from the very, um, well, the late 90s. Um, I was involved in a project called the Common Good Initiative. Um, when I came to the Kiyo School, I saw colleagues, students, and the topic of integral human development as a global dimension. And for me, that's one of the richest experiences uh, here in Notre Dame, the colleagues coming from all over the world, as well as our students. And the highlight for me uh, were two trips to Austria uh, with Notre Dame students, um, um, sponsored by the Nanovic Institute and the Center for Social Concerns. I took a group of students to Austria to look into the situation of refugees in 2017, after you know, the huge impact of uh, refugees in, in Europe. And a group of students a year later, uh, to look at Holocaust memorial sites. And in both cases, uh, the group of students uh, was international and, and taking them to, to Austria um, made me feel like uh, a little bit of a global citizen. You know, you come from a US American university, you work with international colleagues and students and you take them to your native Austria, as I mentioned, small, irrelevant and unimportant, but it is a window to the world, especially when it comes to issues like refugees and, and Holocaust studies. So uh, for me, the global dimension is uh, mainly about relationships, relationships with, with colleagues, uh, students, traditions, um, as well as with, with other cultures. And I'm very grateful uh, you know, to Notre Dame that this is part of what we do uh, day in, day out. Thanks for sharing that. The, the sharing is what's interesting to me about that common thread between what Jason was saying and what you're saying. And Rachel, I, I think about the work that you do with the ISSLP and how important global is within the Center for Social Concerns and this need to share experiences with our students, share um, the network that Notre Dame has created around the world through the Center for Social Concerns. I, I was wondering whether or not that, what Clemens and Jason are saying speaks to you as well. Yeah, I, I mean, what Clemens says really resonates. Um, you know, I just uh, want to add that having a, a there's the a global dimension to my work, to our work, but um, having a global a global dimension is really about um, a mindset and and a and a heart set, too, and um, and uh, that's where the Center for Social Concerns comes in comes in here. Um, 
I'll, I think I was always destined to, uh, to be a part of international global work. My, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a child of uh, immigrant family. My father came to the United States when I was two years old. Um, he traveled from the Philippines at the age of 25 and, and built a home here in the United States for us. Um, and I went to uh, St. Mary's and, and then uh, later Notre Dame for grad school. And after I was finishing my, uh, my master's in theological studies at Notre Dame, uh, literally um, Father Don McNeil, who was the director, who's the founder of the Center for Social Concerns and the director at that time, uh, approached me and, and hired me to, to bring a global dimension to the work of the center. Um, and there I started in, in, the late 90, in the late 90s. Notre Dame was a different place <laughs> in the 90s, as Father Jim would know. Um, during that time, the term international service learning was virtually non-existent in service learning literature. Study abroad was pretty much exclusively only in Europe. And there were a few universities and colleges across the nation with study abroad programming to what we would uh, now call less old countries. Um, so uh, there was a wonderful opportunity for Notre Dame to, to fill that space and to expand our global footprint and network. I, I, uh, I think it's an interesting tension that the university finds itself facing or has faced in the past. Clemens mentioned earlier, and I wanna pick up on this thread about global as being in our DNA. But Rachel, you're also right to point out the ways in which we can be parochial in our own way, right? We're, we're in the Midwest, we're in a, a somewhat more remote location. And there was a desire on the part of the university to imagine what it meant to be more global, right? It takes work to get 75% of our students to study abroad. It takes work to create study abroad programs in um, other parts of the world besides Europe. And I, I appreciate that the challenge um, that you were given to sort of imagine a, a broader sweep, a more inclusive sweep for global education was something you took up and, and something the university took up. Um, Father Jim, when I think about the DNA that we're talking about here that's in Notre Dame's um, body, it seems to me that we would do ourselves uh, well to remember that we were founded by immigrants, right? Father Soren was an immigrant. Four of the six priests with him were uh, from Ireland. So we had uh, a multinational contingent of people founding the university. I wonder if you think about that from your perspective um, as being um, a guiding principle for us when we think about global education, our identity, our origins, and how that might fit into your own thinking about, about global in your own work. Thank you for that, Michael, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, certainly they were immigrants, and and Truly, they came to educate mostly uh, immigrants, right? It was that time in the U.S. where there were many coming. So our founding is deeply rooted in, in a sort of a bringing together of, of, uh, of people from all over the world um, and, and those who had lived here before as we arrived, the Native American community. Um, I just want to say a bit about Rachel mentioned about in the 90s. In, in, when I arrived in 85 as a graduate student and worked in residence life and student affairs, in, in 87, I went to London as the director for the student residences. And in that time, um, I was there three years and it was an excellent study abroad program. And what I find fascinating is how Notre Dame has transformed international education from you know, small opportunities for our students to encounter cultures other than their own, to learn from different perspectives and study with um, people from all over the world into a, just a, a rare moment. I mean, I think of London as being an extension of Notre Dame and our, and our staff and faculty do too. I mean, they see themselves as part of Notre Dame. So South Bend was the locus of Notre Dame for, well, 
a century and more, but it is now remarkably um, vast in its, in its opportunities. When I was in London, there was a young priest um, studying at Oxford who would come in once a month and do mass for us. Now he hasn't amounted to much. His name was John Jenkins. And now he's the president of the University of Notre Dame. But even his vision then and now has always been to, uh, to go global, to, you know, to extend the reach of Notre Dame. And, um, and I would just say one other thing in that regard as I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a priest, so I represent something perhaps more than, uh, than myself. Um, for good or ill, but I, uh, I am struck by how Notre Dame has uh, worked to break down um, barriers across nations, but even now across institutions, our work with partnerships and, and trying to find ways into bringing in international institutions together in our work has been, it has been hugely impressive. So um, it could hardly be said anymore that we're um, an immigrant institution other than that we're international and that everyone is at home in, in the university, I, I hope. Thank you. I appreciate you mentioning Father Jenkins in this context because it seems to me uh, for people who are with us in the webinar today, they may not realize that that title for our conversation today comes from Father Jenkins himself and imagining our global presence as having certain kinds of uh, normative outcomes, right? Healing, enlightening, unifying. I think that's one thing that does separate the University of Notre Dame and our global mission from peer institutions around the country. We're, we're unabashed and bold in saying that there is a transformative power in global education that we're feeling called to, to meet, right? And that that will actually lead to healing in our community. That will lead to a strengthening of the Commonwealth. That will lead to a better and right relationship with one another and, and with God. And I think that that's, uh, an interesting rubric for us to imagine all the work that you all are doing, whether it's through your, through your research or through working with students um, in a global context. Therese, I wanna bring you in. You um, have such a fascinating story in the sense that you have this interest in medieval Europe. And yet I also know that you've done research in Mexico and taken your own scholarship to Latin America. So there's a curiosity in your work um, and it's also a curiosity filled through your own theological interests and, and, and uh, intellectual uh, exploration there. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which faculty research has led you to, to unexpected places around the world? Yeah, um, thank you. So really I got into this kind of global mindset. And it's, it seems a little strange to say it through research into medieval philosophy, precisely because of the global dimension of philosophical thinking in the Middle Ages. Um, so we tend to think of the Middle Ages as a kind of European phenomenon. Um, and when we think about medieval philosophy, we think of people like Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. Um, and it's just really in the last, um, half a century that scholars have really begun to unpack the extent to which the intellectual tradition that we're familiar with from the medieval European universities is heavily dependent on and in conversation with intellectual traditions in the, uh, what's now the Middle East, um, Northern Africa, um, parts of Central Asia. So the, the Islamic world is a huge source of intellectual knowledge for the medieval European tradition. Um, and I really started to, to see this as a, uh, when I was finishing my dissertation and I got involved with the Aquinas and the Arabs project that, that you mentioned. Um, and that group was really my first foray into this international network of scholars that had this dimension of working on this kind of global tradition in the Middle Ages, um, but also was a very global network. And so we, we have members from, I think, every continent and um, and, the, and the, the meetings are held all over the world. So it was really through that, that activity that I started to see that when you interact with other scholars in other countries, you're not just sort of, um, you're not just sort of having a conversation about ideas, you're also beginning to share their life and their intellectual perspective rooted in the kind of education that they get in their milieu. 
Um, and just because it, globalization is this relatively recent phenomenon in scholarship, um, some kinds of disciplines have developed their own kinds of methodologies depending on where, what countries they're in. So the way that Americans are trained to do um, medieval philosophy research is somewhat different from the way that um, this training occurs in, um, in Europe. And that's different from the way that you're gonna find it in the Middle East and in Latin America. And so what happens when these groups come together um, is that people are learning not just new ideas from each other's research in terms of the content, but also in terms of how to do the research differently and what kinds of different questions that you can ask that you might not have ever occurred to you to ask given the way that, uh, the way that you're trained in your own context. Um, so yeah, so, so this kind of research has just brought me to all sorts of really interesting places. And, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the sort of life-changing moments for me was to spend a year on a Humboldt fellowship in Germany which um, I think I, it wouldn't have occurred to me to, to apply to spend these time, this, this time abroad if I hadn't had this network of people encouraging me to do this sort of thing. Um, and it was really as part of that, um, as part of that experience um, and just interacting with the Humboldt Foundation, which is, as you know, this huge driver for uh, global scholarship and international exchange for, for scholars and for graduate students. Um, that I really started to see that uh, doing scholarship in this global way also has, as you were mentioning, Michael, this, this kind of um, healing aspect to it. So the, one of the first uh, presidents of the Humboldt Foundation was Heisenberg. And one of the things that he instituted, he was very insistent on, was what they called the Studienreise or the study trip. Um, so for fellows who are uh, in Germany for a time, they, they bring them on a two week trip through Germany, just visiting cultural and industrial sites of interest. Um, and it seems like kind of a, a, a lavish and extraordinary thing to do to just sort of pull people out of their research context and start taking them to castles and, and museums and factories and things like this in, in various parts of, of Germany. And what Heisenberg wanted to do with that, this is in the post-war period, um, and he said, you know, it's very important for scholars not just to talk to each other sort of cerebrally, but also to see how each other live. And that if we can create these connections internationally among scholars, then we'll be able to, um, those people will go back to their home country with, with a new experience of Germany. And they'll, be, they'll understand something about Germany that will, will cause them to sort of promote more peaceful exchanges between between countries, and and I think about that a lot um, when we when when I'm uh, organizing scholarly activities here and trying to promote an international uh, dimension for the conferences that we organize here at Notre Dame, because I think it's really important to have that that personal connection where people are able to sort of come to our campus and see what it's like and how the research is done and sort of have some time living together in a way. Aristotle talks about the importance of living together as part of a kind of activity of friendship. Um, so I think these international exchanges, it's, it's really important when we, when we have these uh, you know, study abroad programs and, and more extended exchanges where people are really able to come here to Notre Dame and they're also able to go to other places. Our students go to these, to these centers around the world and really spend some time there um, soaking up the way of life of that area. And I think that's just such a tremendous driver for, um, for international cooperation and for people to understand each other. Um, I have, I have to say, I'm, I'm smiling as I listen to you because um, I think you've, you've articulated um, the beauty of that mutual exchange as someone um, who was a Fulbright scholar to Australia, um, the Fulbright scholarship is in, has a similar set of values, right? If I go to your country and you come to my country and we're partnering on research and we're, we're not just studying our disciplines, but we're learning one another's lives and cultures, we're more likely to be in better communication. We're less likely to go to war we're more likely to find common ground to, to build solutions. And, and Notre Dame, uh, people may or may not know on the webinar, we're actually one of the um, universities with the largest number of Fulbright scholars uh, in the US in terms of 
who we host. So the kind of vibrant community, Therese, that you're talking about is something that's really embedded here. It also makes me think, based on what everyone has said so far in the conversation this morning, um, and I, I love to get other people's thoughts on this, this notion that Therese and I are talking about, about learning to live into someone else's experience and learning to respect that. It seems to me that, that what we're really talking about is a notion of solidarity with regard to Catholic social teaching. And I'm wondering how the faculty on, on this panel think about their work in facilitating that, that understanding of human solidarity through your global education work that you do with undergraduates or graduate students. I, I think that that's, uh, again, something that might separate us from our peers and, and speak to how we are unifying and healing and, and promoting. May I say Can something? Can I Rachel? say something there? Oh, let, let oh. Rachel goes first. <laughs> Rachel Thank you, Clements. Clements. That's so kind. Um, I, uh, I, should, I should say that um, as I was using Clemens' work um, in my Global Issues course before I knew Clemens and before I met him um, at a lecture that he gave at the University of Chicago and, and then uh, came to Notre Dame. So I, I knew of Clemens' work before I even got a chance to work with him. Um, but I wanted to say the, you know, to, to the point that Therese and, and Michael were saying, um, you know, the work that, um, that the Center for Social Concerns and, and uh, I and, and many others at the center have been doing around global service learning is exactly just this. You know, um, we, I, I feel there are three ways that, um, that the center and, and, and our students um, are playing an active force in, in, in making a healing and enlightening force for good in our world. And firstly, it's through the pedagogy of, of global service learning. When we engage students in the world, they are learning for active citizenship, um, enhancing academic knowledge, but also providing relevant and meaningful service within a community. They have, our students are working with people um, to solve problems in local communities around the world. Secondly, in, in so doing, our students are in the act of building bridges of solidarity. Um, so you mentioned the work of solidarity, Michael. It's exactly that, um, that in that work, in that shared work and in that shared learning, they're building bridges of solidarity across borders, whether those borders are geopolitical, social, cultural, linguistic, economic. And then thirdly, um, you know, our students time and time again return to campus and reflect on uh, the relationships that they've built during their time abroad and that being the most meaningful thing about their time abroad and about their service learning. And so it's in that relationship building, that friend making, you know, that shared work, exchanging cultures, uh, bridging differences, taking time over cups of tea to learn about people's challenges and, and dreams from others around the globe, that our students are engaging in that real critical work of citizen diplomacy. Um, and that's, that's what I hear the, the two of you saying too. And um, I think, um, I mean, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on, on on that and, and uh, the role that international education plays in fostering soft diplomacy, citizen diplomacy, because um, it's far too important work to be left to world leaders alone. Can I just comment on that, please? Relationships, what, what Rachel mentioned, as uh, maybe the key of, of a truly global education design. Pope Francis talks a lot about encounter and the importance of encounter as uh, being in touch with another person's also suffering and, and desires. Um, Michael mentioned Catholic social teaching and then that's when I thought I have to say something when I hear this word. Um, we believe in human dignity. We believe that God created each person according to God's image 
And that should make it easy for us to think in those global dimensions and to think first and foremost in categories of uh, we are part of one human family and our differences are secondary to this, to this uh, first and foremost union. And that brings naturally this idea of solidarity that both Mike and Rachel talked about. But may I just illustrate one, one little thing what Catholic social teaching can also bring us, namely a little bit of, of self-criticism, if I may, if, if, if I may. My, my very first international experience with Notre Dame was in September 2014. I was still working at King's College London and uh, the Nanovic Institute under the legendary leadership of Jim McAdams uh, hosted an event in, in Rome in the Global Gateway uh, together with the Catholic University Partnership where you have uh, six Central and Eastern European Catholic universities partnering uh, with the Nanovic Institute for, for more than a decade now. And they came together in the Global um, Gateway in Rome to talk about um, civic societies. And I was deeply, deeply impressed by the hospitality that Notre Dame with its Global Gateway and, and of course also the resources that Nanovic provided uh, could offer to our partners. That was deeply impressive. Also facilitating dialogue, that was deeply impressive. Also having a spiritual foundation. So we had mass every morning um, as part of the, the conference setting. So this was deeply impressing, uh, impressive. Um, on the other hand, and that's, that's part of my, my self-critical note to thinking about our global dimension, you had a number of different people coming together in Rome, uh, speaking English with each other in a, in a kind of US-American setting. And so one point for us to reflect on is uh, the issue of depth when we talk about our international dimension. And that's where immersions and Rachel mentioned, you know, longer term experience in the country matter. The second is local knowledge and languages, you know, coming, coming from, from, from Europe, where we are encouraged uh, to, to learn uh, one or the other language. I think that's important that um, I think it's much more difficult for an English speaking person to learn another language because people love to speak English and, and uh, the motivation is, is a little lower. But I think we, we should emphasize that. And thirdly, um, the ecological question. Ever since Lauda to see, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, Rachel mentioned global footprint. There's a double meaning to that. On the one hand, it's, it's impact and, and being a force for good in the world. On the other hand, it's also ecological footprint. And Lauda to see, I think, is an invitation to make it a little more difficult for us to take flights lightheartedly and, and to shift the, the burden of proof a little bit. I'm overseeing a, a CST capstone project of a student who thinks about international travel in the light of CST and international education. And I'm not saying that what we do is not right. I'm just saying, coming from a Catholic soul teaching perspective, these issues of respecting the local and immersion encounter and the ecological dimension would matter as we, as we you know, go ahead and think about global education also in terms of beyond travel. And the times you're in, I think, taught us a lot about we, we can do global stuff without necessarily having to go to these places, however important these immersions may be. And however important NDI is, Michael, don't get me wrong, and I'm shutting up right here. No, no, no. You're I, no. I appreciate those. I appreciate those comments, and also the the critique. I think I would just say one thing, and then I want to bring Jason in because I think his experience of taking students to Colombia is a really interesting case in point or um, uh, alternative uh, understanding of of what we're talking about right now. But I would just say two things. One is I think you're right, Clemens, to uh, caution us about the potential dilettantish nature of, of, of travel and of being abroad, right? If I go to a place and I have a quick experience that somehow I understand it, or that somehow that's enough that I've ticked a box, right? And, and we, we work hard, I think, as a university, our faculty and our students and the team at Notre Dame International to try and program against that. So for all of my colleagues from the study abroad team at NDI who are, are in the webinar, they work tirelessly with students, having conversations, listening to them about where they're at. What do you want out of this experience? What are your aspirations and goals intellectually, personally, professionally, spiritually? And then how do we hold you accountable and the system accountable to make that a meaningful experience 
that you take ownership of and integrate into your curriculum, right? So that global education isn't a, 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 um, a break, it's not um, time off, rather it's something that's really embedded in, in transforming who I am and what my actions and choices are in the future, whether that's about the environment or that's about my career choice or about how I, how I interact with people in my residence hall. So I think um, I, I wanna applaud those, those team members and colleagues um, for their work. But I also think, Jason, you have an experience where you worked hard to deprogram students from their expectations, both about Colombia, about Latin America, about, um, uh, about American studies. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and, and take us a little further on this uh, portion of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, thank you for bringing it up. And it actually relates a lot to what, you know, Clemens had to say and that sort of self-criticism. A couple of years ago, or about a year and a half ago, I hit the jackpot because Notre Dame International selected a, a proposal of mine for the Insider Project. So for those of you who don't know, the Insider Project was this program where if someone had expertise in a country other than the United States, they could take a group of students to that country to explore some in common intellectual questions. And my favorite thing about this program is that there were no strings attached. There was no grading. There were no credits. There was, there, there was, there was, uh, there was not a lot of uh, bureaucracy involved with it. But I struggled with some of these questions that you're bringing up, and that Clemens, I think, very rightly brought up about the sort of I I, I got to take six students to Colombia to study uh, post-war on drugs uh, reconciliation in Colombia. Uh, and to understand, A, the role that the U.S. played in shaping contemporary Colombia through war on drugs uh, policies such as Plan Colombia, but then also how the country views itself in terms of drug policy. And um, we were there at this amazing time where Notre Dame played a, a, a role in helping to sign a peace accord that um, was supposed to end a more than 60 year civil war. So we were in Colombia at this amazing time and I really, really wanted to make sure that students had something more than a superficial experience. And I didn't want students to think that they could go to Colombia for two weeks and think that they knew Colombia. I mean, that would, that would have been a big mistake. There was something else going on at the time. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll try not to uh, go too far in the weeds with this, but there was a, a, a migrant crisis happening in Venezuela at the time, or obviously political crisis going on in Venezuela. So as we were going to Cali, Colombia, tens of thousands of Venezuelans were walking, literally walking through the country of Colombia to get to other economies in South America. So there was this, this migrant these migrant caravans walking through. So we had so much going on and I was so desperate to, uh, to cover as much as I possibly could. You know, I had my post-war on drugs, you know, sort of intellectual goals, but I also felt like this huge burden that I could not pretend like a human rights crisis was not happening and that we would not be witnessing a homeless encampment of Venezuelan migrants on every single taxi ride that we took jetting around Colombia or, or Cali and other parts of Colombia that we visited. So I did build in a service day where we worked with the Archdiocese of Cali and we did uh, work in a soup kitchen. We met many Venezuelan migrants and we um, got to know their stories a little bit. That was one day of these students' lives and that certainly was not enough to deal with so, all of the social and political and cultural issues that I wanted to cover. But if I could sort of tell you a quick happy ending to this story, um, you, you know, so like I, I wanna say first, I do understand and agree and commiserate with these challenges, but one of the students I took on that trip went back the next summer and she spent uh, seven weeks in Colombia working with migrant populations uh, she was she was working on her senior thesis and she collected oral histories of Venezuelan migrants and one of those migrant families kind of adopted her as one of their own daughters and she had this incredibly profound deep experience with with people in Cali with uh, Venezuelan migrants who were experiencing displacement and poverty and all of these various issues that we dealt with so I think that that sort of follow-up experience really helped me 
make peace with the superficiality of my own experience because it did teach me that one of those six students could go and have a much deeper experience. She's still in touch with that family. I'm still in touch with that family. Uh, I do think that it relates to something that Rachel said. If we can kind of be the diving board where like we could kind of start these experiences, we could kind of spring them off into the world to have meaningful experiences that follow even, even experiences that are more superficial than we want. I, I, do, I do take solace in that. I do find some hope in that. And I think that the other five students who are on the project might also have deeper intellectual and international experiences down the road. So there's a lot going on there, but I think that the work that we do, I, I also had to learn to go a little bit easier on myself to think like, my six students and me are not gonna solve the Venezuelan migrant crisis in two weeks. <laughs> but we can become human beings that are more compassionate and are willing to do the work uh, to get people, to get our, our compatriots thinking about these issues. And maybe our students will down the road will be doing deeper, more meaningful work. I think that's really beautifully said, Jason. Thank you for that. And it, and it anticipates a question that I saw in the, the Q and A uh, chat feature. Uh, from uh, Elena Manjore Lora, who was asking about whether or not there are certain kinds of new toolkits or new expectations and frameworks for how we prepare our students to have the kinds of experiences that you're talking about. And um, I think that we have to give ourselves the space and the language, to your point, to be able to have that conversation with the student. I think that's another dimension of global education at Notre Dame that is different. We're happy to say that we will fall short. We're not going to be able to solve that, that migration crisis. We're not going to be able to change everyone's mind, but we can have the conversation within our community and within the structures that we have to say, well, how will we empower ourselves to at least move further down that path of engagement and encounter. I think that notion of encounter, we haven't talked about encounter as a framework to think about um, how research is done or how social change happens or how we make decisions about, about where we invest globally. But I'm wondering whether or not that might be a way to think about um, how we, how, we, how we give ourselves that break that you were talking about, but how we also empower our students to make really good, complicated decisions. I don't know how people feel about that or your thoughts. If, I, Jen. if I might add something here, uh, to Jason's point, I'm, I've not followed the research on this, but the tracking of students who, stu who had the opportunities like those that Jason provided through, your, the, through NDI, um, the likelihood of their, their doing international travel and, 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 and uh, returning to the various places that they've been seems to be quite high. I do want to acknowledge what Clement said about uh, the, the, the criticisms of Catholic social teaching, but there is one interesting, um, well, there's, this is new to me. <clears throat> so this might be said to be you know, a new tack on this, um, on what we've done. The Center for Social Concerns has created this this opportunity for students to think deeply about um, the impact they have on the world and, and, and ultimately how the impact that others have on them. But we've started offering an, uh, at uh, the learner program for students who study there, we take 160 up to now before the pandemic came and surprised us all. Um, and a number of them do internships at Catholic schools in Britain, which are, are quite different in some ways than our Catholic educational system in the States. But they also do, uh, I teach a course with uh, Josh Copeland, who's the executive director of the London Global Gateway on Catholic social teaching in the charitable sector. And we have a number of students who actually do um, service learning, community-based learning in various uh, charities, nonprofits in the greater London area. Now, not all of our students are Catholic and not all of those um, charities are Catholic, but the, the course is grounded in Catholic social teaching because of you know, what that has to teach, not only Catholics, but others, and it's certainly drawn upon by many others. Um, but the, the notion of human dignity, you know, 
the notion of solidarity, all the ways in which we try to emphasize in our students that we are a global community. And I think, you know, you can't, I grew up in a small town in Northern Minnesota and it was pretty homogenous and uh, that I should be as happy as I am in a major international capital like London surprises me. But our students too, they find themselves walking from our residence to our academic building and they will pass at least a dozen people experiencing homelessness. They cannot, they cannot avoid that encounter with the reality of so many other people and the diversity of the world and the other ways in which you might learn something in an international capital that you wouldn't learn other, in other places. And so I, I think the opportunities, even beyond what we might offer within our courses, but um, the experiential opportunities and the travel opportunities um, have a remarkable impact on our young people and the way they think about their place in the universe and, and, and in, in the global community. So I'm grateful for, so grateful for the opportunity to encounter them during that time while they're there, because it, it is transformative. And, and this is four months, so a little longer than the six weeks that, that Jason had, but you know, all the more kind of a regular encounter with people who are in need. And it's, uh, it's impressive to see how they react. Father Jim, I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, the, the holiness and the sacred in encounter you know, is, is what you're saying and, and, and meeting one another. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, it, um, you know, I'm struck by our, our, our current context with uh, the coronavirus and, um, you know, and, and how that changes what encounter looks like <laughs> now, you know, encounter looks like this <laughs> across screens, um, as opposed to being able to touch hands and and um, hold hands and, and, and touch faces. Um, but, uh, um, and if we're, if it's still possible to, you know, how, how we, how we embrace that holiness and in, in encounter these days during the, the coronavirus. I, th I think that's a really, um, a fascinating point. And it, and it makes me want to pivot to thinking about encounter on campus in South Bend for a second, both in the time of the pandemic and outside of it. When I think about what we've just been talking about, I'm thinking about the ways in which um, there is plenty to encounter globally on campus if we are open and receptive and aware to it. So uh, in the in the Q and A feature, um, Alejandra Sahura, uh, welcome. It's great to see you here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, you were asking questions about centers and margins, and about whether or not there's some sort of notion of universal bonding or community. When I think about uh, Notre Dame International and and our strategic uh, mission, one of the things that we work to do is to make sure that campus is more international. And that means that we, no matter where we come from or what our background is, that we see those who are different from us on campus. We see them, we hear them, we are affirming their presence, we realize the integral value that they bring to the community. Um, but that takes work, that kind of encounter to see international uh, members of our community in our midst can be challenging. 30% of our grad students are international, 7% of our, our undergraduates in, la in last year's entering class are, are international. Um, this is an important part of the work that we do as a university, but I'm wondering how all of you see international students in the classroom, international students in the community, international colleagues in your departments. Um, wh what role do, do these people play in, in making Notre Dame what Notre Dame is? May, may I go? Please. Um, one, one key word I would like to use is contributive justice. So teaching international students for me poses the challenge to make sure that each one feels encouraged and invited, maybe even expected to contribute uh, to the course since this is our course. I always find it enriching if, if um, you know, students from um, other backgrounds, faith traditions, uh, other um, countries of origin 
um, contribute to our discussions, bring in new uh, news feed. I also ask students, do you have sources that we can use, that we can share with our colleagues? And there's, there's really a learning curve for me right here and there, but you need to facilitate this um, atmosphere of um, anxiety free spaces where this encounter can, can really happen. And so I, I do think that that's homework for us in the future to uh, think about internationalization and encounter as, as, as two very important categories. And, and uh, the way I try to, to teach is really um, facilitating the possibilities for encounter, inviting students to give us teaching inputs, share sources with us so that we can really have this contributive justice uh, setting in our, in our teaching um, setup. Can I jump in on this? Um, so I think in one of, the, one of the challenges maybe for interacting with international students is um, when the community that they're part of doesn't have that reciprocal experience of knowing what it's like to be coming into an academic environment from another country and having these kind of cultural challenges and these linguistic challenges. Um, and so, one of the one of the things that I think is actually really you know crucial about the the study abroad programs that we have is that it helps the American students to understand better what international students are are experiencing on campus um, because it's really easy to sort of you know get frustrated with linguistic difficulties or just to sort of very superficially have this kind of interest oh yes you cook this this different thing for your family's traditional dinner for this festival um, and just sort of treat the the differences as it, in this sort of superficial and decorative way and that really and, and so I think once somebody has had the experience of going somewhere else and feeling what that's like to be trying to eat you yourself to be the one that's trying to integrate with this new environment, that really makes you more sensitive to the challenges that other people are experiencing. And then also um, more, more sensitive, I think, to, the, to where the common ground is. And I think that, that was part of, uh, part of this question is how, how do we manage to find this kind of universal dimension in our discussions across these you know, international boundaries? Um, and, and I think we often don't know how to do that until we've had the experience of being in a situation where we have to try. And then we start to see that the, that the differences actually are embodiments. I think about this a lot as a philosopher because we're always negotiating the relationship between the universal and the particular. Um, but that we start to see if you spend enough time trying to be part of this new context, um, you realize that the things that first appeared to be strange to you, this is kind of process, first you, the, the thing seems strange and just totally, you can't understand it at all. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's a different way of embodying some deeper sort of unity that, the, the, that I can see how there's a kind of shared sort of concern or a shared experience underneath that's really embodied very differently. Um, so that's something that I think really, the inter, having international students on campus and also our students going to other places, it really, it, gives that that ability to experience reality in that way and it's good for both groups to be doing that at the same time I think for the culture that we're trying to develop on campus. I agree with that 100% but I want to be cautious to not then also keep the U.S. American students centered. You know I think that the presence of international students on campus is not only to benefit the U.S. students and give them a more international perspective. It's also to benefit those international students. If they choose to study about abroad here, you know, or, or choose to, to go to college in an entirely different country, I mean, that's such a brave choice, and they d absolutely deserve to be at the center of our teaching and at the center of our mission. You know, I think it's as much their campus as it is any student's campus. And in my own teaching, I, I, I like, like I was talking about before we, we launched the, the, the meeting, uh, the, the, the people on the panel. I, I'm teaching, I was just teaching our big intro to American studies. I kept having to fight the urge to say, well, what do you think our country is? You know, like, like how, how did you as an American, you know, growing up here, you know, there were definitely international students in the room. And I'm also fighting the urge to center our own U.S. American students and to say, this is not their campus. They don't own it. <laughs> we all own it together. And that has to include our international students as well. 
I think this yeah, is I just want to add oh, go ahead, oh sorry Michael no, I have just one ahead. more point I just want to add to to this discussion to say you know international students and scholars I think we all agree are, are critical to the identity identity and mission of our Catholic University and I say Catholic big C Roman Catholic Church but also Catholic small C you know um, the the universality the inclusiveness of what is truly Catholic yeah, I appreciate that. And I think that's well said. And we've we've been talking both implicitly and explicitly all morning about our Catholic identity, our Catholic mission, what that calls us to do, how it calls us to do that. And I think this conversation about international students is certainly uh, trenchant to that point. We're, we're very fortunate to have within Notre Dame International, our international students and scholars team that supports these students. But the support of international students to Jason and Teresa's point goes to our faculty who are mentoring them. It goes to our residence hall staff like um, Father Jim and others uh, as well. It goes to student affairs team members who are supporting uh, developing leadership. It really does take the entire community to imagine what's possible. I do also think that this, this um, conversation, uh, Jag, uh, actually speaks to something very important, which people often don't think about with regard to global education is that um, those who are practitioners of global education, those that are advocates of global education, we have a special leadership role to play, I believe, in supporting multicultural dialogue. It's easy to think that multicultural dialogue only happens, at least in America, within an American context about racial and ethnic um, uh, sectors of American society, when in fact, there, there are multiple ways and multiple entry points into the discussion for thinking about the kinds of values that we instill in global education, understanding ambiguity, not uh, defining in a narrow way, living with uncertainty, um, negotiating and compromising to understanding a position. These things come out of living in a global context. We've heard all of you talk about that throughout the morning. Um, I think global education has a role to play in a larger, um, both American cultural and global uh, multicultural conversation about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because to Jason's point or, a, or a, a variation on Jason's point, right? Diverse from whom? Uh, equitable with whom? right? Inclusive with what, right? There are lots of questions that we in global education can help um, shape the conversation on. One of the questions in the Q&A um, that we haven't answered before I get to our final question of the morning um, is uh, Charlie Pine asked us, who do we look to for um, advice, guidance, clarity on what our global engagement is? Do we get that from our, our spiritual beliefs? Do we get it from a sense of our professional motivations? Do we get it from some sort of disciplinary understanding? Um, how do people understand what they're called to do globally and how the university uh, can, can check itself on that? It's an interesting question. The way I read the question is um, how can we be healed and unified and enlightened uh, uh, before we bring healing, unification, enlightenment to others. And, and my personal experience is uh, I, I'm an Austrian um, whose English is not bad, but far from perfect. And so I struggle. I mean, English is a very difficult language, frankly. So I struggle in the classroom. I have to ask students, well, how do we pronounce that? Or do you have a word for that? Um, and so one key value for me is uh, humility humility um, and just getting exposed to a linguistically challenging context uh, helps with humility. And also this, this understanding of, uh, well, I, I need uh, others uh, in order to be healed. I think that's where, where Charlie Pine was, was coming from, is, is a very good default position. And that's uh, one of the, I think also future uh, homeworks for, for us here in Notre Dame to ensure reciprocity and, and to make sure in, in, in Notre Dame's engagement with the world, we, we have this, and you mentioned, uh, Michael, dialogue and, and, and a two-way street. 
that, that Notre Dame is, is willing to learn as much as, 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 as we are willing to give. And, and coming back to the Catholic University partnership that I mentioned before, one of the flagship projects at the Nanovig Institute, that's a very good example of uh, mutuality and reciprocity. Uh, the Nanovig Institute may have been the facilitator um, in, in, in the past, but now it's, it's uh, you know, um, one player among others and friendships have, have stemmed from that. And, and we have those regular meetings, which makes it, by the way, easier to justify a conference if it's part of a longer term perspective where people come and go. Um, but there is so much, I, I remember, last word about that, September 2014, conflict Ukraine-Russia, uh, and I was so impressed by the colleagues from Ukraine talking about their solidarity with, with those who suffer in their own country. And I coming from a you know, privileged uh, Austrian England, uh, or English context, uh, wasn't even aware of, of the depth of the suffering. So I, I thought this was healing for me to understand the level of solidarity of people who don't have the level of privilege that I would have. So humility would be one of the values that I would throw into the mix. I, if I might add, I think that Notre Dame's gift to the world is the space it gives for convening um, our students and how they learn from one another with our faculty. But globally, I mean, we, we bring together in our gateways various groups of people um, that might not otherwise come together. And we create a space, I think, of mutuality and of solidarity that, that is um, enlightening and healing when it needs to be. And even a moment like this, that we take the time to talk about such things, this, and this might be a segue into, I don't know if we're going to talk about what's coming, but this, even this virtual opportunity that we have, where people are coming together in numbers that have never happened before, to have conversations that we've been having, but on a, on a far more limited basis. And so, and, and the ways in which Notre Dame convenes people is broad. I mean, liturgically is important in our tradition, and <clears throat> around prayer and spirituality. I mean, those are deep, deeply rooted in, in, the, in, the, in the movement of healing and hope. And, uh, and so that it is available and an option as much as any other in a context like this is, is truly important and ought to be, ought to be noted more often. Um, but in all other ways in which we gather, I wouldn't make light of any way in which we gather, um, that, we, that we be about the business of mutuality, mutual respect, the opportunity that we have to further our, our uh, community to, and, and enhance it. I think those are both well said. And I, I just would, would add that I think the mutuality is facilitated by embracing that humility, embracing the uh, being comfortable with what we don't know, being comfortable to learn, being comfortable to say, I don't know the answer, or I can't pronounce that, or I don't understand that. Because I think that's that position of humility is quite extraordinary in, the, in, in our current world, I would say. Um, let's go to that final question that Father Jim primed the pump for. Uh, the last question in our remaining 10 minutes together is, what is the future for global education at Notre Dame? What do each of you see uh, being uh, the direction we're headed or where would you recommend that we as an institution should go? Um, it's an open-ended question. Um, the future seems both terrifying with the pandemic but perhaps brighter as we think about uh, potential vaccines coming onto the horizon, but it's been a, a revolutionary and tumultuous time. So what does the future hold to, for each of you and for us? Can I jump in on this? Please, Therese. So I've been thinking about this a, a bit because um, in, at the, in this end of about exactly a year ago, um, uh, in the philosophy department, we started a new initiative called the History of Philosophy Forum that was meant as a kind of internationalizing initiative. Um, we were working on bringing international scholars to campus and helping our uh, graduate students interact with people who could potentially have projects, um, postdocs globally. Um, and of course, just as we were ready to launch, the, we were having our uh, launch scheduled for the middle of March. And the week before that was when everything shut down because of COVID. So we've had to be thinking uh, about what the future looks like for these kind of international exchanges um, in a situation where we can only interact virtually. And it's been kind of a surprise the extent to which um, it's possible to have good scholarly conversations through these, these mechanisms of you know, Zoom and, and, and these other kind of Skype or whatever. But 
Uh, one of the things that we're really finding we're missing is the opportunity to sort of have these kind of moments of personal living together. And you really begin to miss the fact that at a conference, one of the things that you're doing is you're, you're eating meals together. And you see people in the breakfast room at the hotel and things like that. And there's, there's a sort of uh, casualness to those conversations that really stimulates uh, thoughts that, you, that wouldn't have come up in formal Q and A's. So I think one of the things for us in, in dealing with this whole pandemic um, sort of new environment that we're living in is the extent to which the importance of the personal has really become sort of centered as, as something that you know, we, we really can't do without as scholars if we're gonna have this kind of international exchange. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to weigh in on what the future holds? If I could uh, make two really quick points. Um, I cheated a little bit and looked in the Q&A and Rochelle uh, said that she was a former international student and said that humor was part of the experience of getting stuff wrong. And I have to say, we have talked about some serious soul searching stuff to this morning. And I want to say like, for me, humor and fun has got to be part of all of this as well. Um, I truly hope you don't audit me because um, my, part of <laughs> what we did in my uh, international experience with the students in Colombia was salsa lessons because you cannot go to the, the global capital of, of, of salsa dancing without uh, taking a lesson or two yourself. So we had a lot of fun on that trip too. And I hope that remains part of the, our internationalization. But if you wanna ask me about the future, um, my hope and dream is further growth in Latin America. We have an amazing um, program in Chile and many of our uh, American studies majors have had really great experience there. But I'm also noting really great work going on uh, in Mexico City. Mike Telfit's doing great work growing that program. Uh, and I really hope that we will continue to look for growth opportunities in on the entire, in, in all of the Americas, because, you know, Chile is great, but like, it's so different than other countries in Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, I really hope we'll grow in that direction. Thanks for those shout outs about Latin America. It is certainly a critical place that we are engaged in, have been for a long time, uh, even back into the uh, 1880s, when we brought students from Mexico to South Bend uh, to study together on campus. Um, those on the webinar may or may not know that in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, our college bulletin about courses and course policies was bilingual in English and Spanish because we had such a large contingent of students from Mexico and Cuba. So there is a long, rich history and tradition which uh, we are actively trying to reignite and to support. So that's very encouraging. I also appreciate you shouting out uh, our colleague and friend, um, Rochelle from Jerusalem. Welcome, we're glad to have you here this morning and humor is important as well. And, and I appreciate you talking about joy. We, I don't even think I've used the word joy today and I regret that because I think we all agree that part of global engagement is about uh, sparking joy in some sort of way. Any final comments about other, other oh, go ahead. I might just follow up on something Therese said. It, 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 if we ever thought that this sudden turn to online education out of necessity might lead to diminishment of our offering in-person classes, nothing further from the truth would be true because it, it couldn't be further from the truth because we realize that it's not just a delivery of content. It's, it's really about the education of the heart and mind, which is what Moreau spoke of in, in his early writings and the Pope speaks of it now. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transformational experience and not simply an educational one. And where that healing and that unity is going to happen is in a context that is in person and, and has the opportunity to know joy together. It's a little hard to do that online. I mean, I think those occasional encounters that we have in all the locations we are throughout the world, and please God, there will be many more, um, are really the root of the joy that we experience in. So thank you. 
So we are coming back to encounter as a key category. <laughs> I'm not sure whether Jason used the word joy as much as he used the word fun. And <laughs> coming, coming from Europe, uh, there may be a slight difference between fun and joy and the joy of the gospel. No, no criticism, of course. <laughs> but I do think next to curiosity, joy is, is such an important um, you know, uh, source of energy. And if you ask me about the future of international education, um, the word cooperation comes to mind and the word commitment. Cooperation, Notre Dame, um, collaborating with a partner. Uh, we have that at the Q School with the iLab and Notre Dame partners with an NGO or another partner. And I think that's very helpful as we, as we move along. And in the Nanovic Institute, we are carefully selecting partners in Europe with whom we want to have long-term relationships, which is the, the next keyword, commitment, investing in um, long-term perspectives where we can you know, be a unifying and unified force for the good together with other institutions of goodwill, if I may use the term. And uh, Pope Francis has talked about the joy right, of the university. And I think that's, that's what we have to radiate in the work that we do. And you do that so well, Mike, and all the fellow panelists, the joy of what we do. That's what we need in those dark times. Absolutely. I'm just going to round this off and, and say, um, uh, I mean, I'm going to say something that we all know uh, as international educators, but we've always known the importance uh, of international cooperation and coordination to solve our world's problems. And the pandemic has, has, taught us that, reminded us that once again. Um, as far as the future of uh, global education um, as a field, I, you know, I stay up late at night thinking about this. Um, it's both terrifying and, um, and exciting, um, especially as, you know, in this time of restricted mobility. Um, but what is amazing to me is the ways that um, the field of global education has um, pivoted during this time. I mean, Michael, the way your team working with our international students in Asia um, and uh, you know, our students um, from China who weren't able to come to campus but are engaged in as university students um, until, they can, until we can bring them on campus. Um, you know, any one of us um, who in the field of uh, service learning or global service learning, when we're not able to serve side by side with one another, um, have pivoted to the, to the Zoom screen to work on virtual projects and virtual service learning projects. Um, in a short period of time, what we've been challenged to do um, to really you know, uh, hone those skills of adaptability and flexibility that we all have as, as international educators put to the test during this pandemic. And I think that there's, there's a lot of lessons that we um, will continue to learn from this, um, but certainly greater accessibility is that, um, where international education has been challenged by, um, you know, mobility of certain populations and the challenges of economics or, or um, physical ability. Um, this time during the pandemic has taught us that um, there is, uh, that we can be more creative about how um, we bring and do global education and, and quote unquote study abroad um, to other populations and increase that accessibility um, I think uh, with regards to Notre Dame, um, the future looks bright and um, expansion in Asia and the continent of Africa. And um, I'm excited for Notre Dame to, um, to further explore networks and, and opportunities there. As I know you're doing, we're all doing. Well, thank you for that. Thanks to everyone for those final thoughts, looking into the crystal ball or shaking the magic eight ball and seeing what the answer is that comes up in terms of our future. I do think collectively we can agree that it is bright in spite of, or maybe in part because of um, some of the things that are going on right now. I also feel very humbled that we are standing um, in the footsteps and in the shadows of those that have come before us, we're, we're not inventing global education at Notre Dame. We 
we come after 175 plus years of global education that comes before us. And that's uh, a source of strength and encouragement for me personally and professionally, but I think for all of us as a community. I want to end this morning by thanking several groups of people. First, I'd like to thank uh, members of my team who have helped make this possible in support of International Education Week, Judy Hutchinson, Suzanne Wilson, Catherine Wilson, Ali Richthammer, Katie Kovar. I also want to thank all of our uh, webinar uh, listeners from around the world. As you've heard, we've had people in Europe, we've had people in Israel, we've had people in South Bend. It's a testament to our global footprint that we were talking about earlier that our audience is global as well. And that's how the Notre Dame family is. And that's how uh, we should imagine ourselves being as an active presence throughout the world, um, engaging people one encounter at a time. Finally, uh, I want to encourage those, or two last things. First, I'd like to encourage those that have been listening and have stuck with us to the end. Please know that all of our panelists are happy to continue to engage the conversation on email or however you see fit to engage them. We're really committed and we hope that you hear the vocation behind our, uh, our work. I think that's important. And again, it's something that separates Notre Dame and Notre Dame International and these wonderful colleagues um, with regard to their commitment uh, for global education. So please continue the conversation with us. Most importantly, I want to thank my fellow panelists and conversation partners. It's been an absolute joy to use that word again. Uh, a lot of fun and a pleasure. So Father Jim Lease, Professor Jason Ruiz, Professor Clemens Sedmak, Professor Rachel Thomas Morgan, Professor Therese Corey, thank you so much for your insights, your support of Notre Dame's global mission and vision, and um, for all your work with our students. So thank you. Everyone be well and enjoy the end of the semester. Take thank care. you so much. Thank Thanks. You. Good to thank be with you. you all. Thanks a lot. A lot of fun and Bye. joyful. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.